a, a nation whose name literally means soldier of God. And they're having this spiritual crisis. And the leaders, leaders of the country were steering the country away from God. The queen at the time, her name was Jezebel, she's trying to make idol worship of Baal the official religion of the country. And so this is the nature of the country then. And faithfulness to the Lord in the midst of this spiritual crisis, faithfulness to the Lord was only a concern for those who were narrow-minded. Faithfulness to the Lord was, was only a concern for those who were troublemakers and those who were not tolerant of the way other people worship. Who would ever think? Who would ever think that in a nation founded by the miraculous intervention of the Lord God himself, whose name literally means soldier of God, that it would be a crime, it'd be a crime to, to, to worship the one true living God, or at least extremely, extremely unpopular. That was the nation of Israel 850 years before Christ. Does anything sound familiar here? As a result, morale among the faithful was low. You know, and, and the only thing that God had done recently was that three years ago he sent a drought and it hadn't rained for three years and they're going, oh, come on, God. Can't you do better than that? And people were feeling, feeling pretty bad. You know, when we say everything going wrong around us, it's very easy for us to say, I bet God doesn't listen. I bet God doesn't exist. I bet God won't be there for us when I need God. And that's what was going on 850 years before Christ came to earth. Now, if you have your sermon notes, I want you to, to write something down in your sermon notes. This is the first thing. Because these are the times when we need that mountaintop experience. We need a mountaintop experience of faith. And that's what happened on Mount Carmel. It was a mountaintop experience of God working. And so we need to trust God. We need to trust God that he's going to move. And so just write this down. Trust God to move in power. Trust God to move in power despite what I see going on around me and what I, what I sort of interpret through my physical eyes in the flesh. Trust that God is moving in power. He's been moving since creation and he's continuing to move in power throughout history until that day when all heaven and earth are going to be reconciled at the end of time. He is moving in power. He is still moving in power. And you can trust that God is moving in power. So let's look at Mount Carmel. It's a mountain of faith. And as we look at this passage, there are two people here, two main characters. One is Elijah. Elijah is a prophet of God. And the other is Ahab. Ahab is the unfaithful king of the northern kingdom of Israel. Would you please stand with me in honor of God's word? 1 Kings chapter 18. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. This is the third year of the drought saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I'll send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. Now I'm going to skip down to verse 17. This is when Ahab and Elijah actually meet. When Ahab saw Elijah, Elijah said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I've not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you've abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. Lord Jesus, I pray here as we read about this call to the confrontation, Lord, I pray that we would be the people that not only see you move in power, Lord, but that we would move alongside you, Lord, and that we would, we would coincide with your power, Lord, that we'd see you, we'd declare your marvelous excellencies to those that you have brought us out of the darkness into your marvelous light. Lord, give us that power. Give us that awareness. In your precious name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. As we go through this passage, I first want to share with you what you need to understand about what God doesn't need in order to move in power. See, there are certain things that we think God's need, God needs to move in power that he really doesn't need. And, and when Elijah confronted King Ahab, look at verse 18, he says, you know, you're the one that's causing the problem. You're, you're causing the problem, King Ahab, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. You see, the days of Elijah were days of unfaithful power brokers. 
The days of Elijah were days when the government leaders were unfaithful to the Lord. And you know what unfaithful leaders try to do? They, faithless leaders try to blame other people for their problems. Amen. And that's what happened. King Ahab, he said, look, Elijah, you're the troubler of Israel. And I want to say to you is this. Don't be discouraged by unfaithful power brokers. Don't be discouraged by unfaithful power brokers, people leading the nation that don't have any understanding of, of, of a relationship with God, any understanding of God's will. Because if we want God to move, some would tell you that the first thing we have to do is get rid of unfaithful leadership. Well, that's not the first thing we got to do. Because God can move in power in spite of unfaithful leaders. He's done it in the past. He'll do it in the future. Let me give you a biblical history lesson. 1 Kings chapter 16, two chapters earlier. Starting at verse 25, it tells about Ahab's dad. His name is Omri. And it says in, in 1 Kings 16, verse 25, it says, Omri did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did more evil than all who were before him. He was a bad dude. Now, move down to 1 Kings 16, verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. I mean, think about this. Elijah knew that God was moving and that the movement of God cannot be blocked by unfaithful power brokers. Ahab was faithless before Mount Carmel. And Ahab was faithless before the, after the strong movement of God on Mount Carmel. Do you realize that? He was faithless all the way through. And God, it didn't stop God. It didn't stop God at all. God's power does not depend on the faithfulness of our political leaders. I think it would help. I think it would help if our political leaders were faithful to God. I certainly think that it would help. But God's power does not depend on the faithfulness of political leaders. That's not the make or break condition for God to move in power. So don't be discouraged by unfaithful power brokers. Now, continuing on, verse 20 of 1 Kings chapter 18, it says this, So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, get this, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal, then follow Him. And the people did not answer him a word. Stone, cold, Silence. See, the people of Israel were trying to have it both ways. They didn't want to make God angry, and they didn't want to make the king angry. So they're trying to, trying to toe the line there on both sides. And, and Elijah called them out on it, and, and when he called them out on them, they didn't do anything. They just sat there, unresponsive. Some of you think that we need to get a great movement of people in order for God to work. I want you to know, don't be discouraged by unresponsive people. God still works even, even when there are unresponsive people. Unresponsive people do not stop God. Apathetic people do not stop God. That word limping literally means walking along on, on wobbly legs. They wouldn't make the choice to serve God. You see, they wanted, they wanted to have their choices. They wanted to have the good things that come from following the thing, king, the money, the, the political favor, all that stuff, and they wanted to have the blessings of God. So they're just sort of going halfway, and, and we like that too. We want, we want to have all the choices that, that, we, we, that we can have, as many choices as we possibly can. We like six phone companies and 31 flavors of ice cream and 200 channels that we'll never watch. We like all that kind of stuff. And, but what we're doing is we're conditioning ourselves. We're conditioning ourselves with so many choices that when we say or when we hear that there is only one God and that one God shows us eternal life through that one man, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and the only way to have eternal life is through him, we hesitate. Because we think, well, where are the other choices? I need to weigh the options. We don't know how to handle it, limping along. And this contagion has infected churches. You know, the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life says that 65% of, not Americans, 65% of Christians, 65% of Christians say that there are multiple paths to eternal life. 65% 
of people who say they follow Jesus Christ reject the words of Jesus Christ when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. The people said nothing, did nothing. Unresponsive people. The movement of God does not depend on how people respond. Now, I'm not defending apathetic people at all. Uh, there, there's no excuse for that. But I want you to know, if you're faithful to the Lord, you want to see God move in power, God's movement in power does not depend on, on apathetic people. He does not depend on the responsiveness of people. Praise God, His power doesn't depend on people. Now look at verse 22. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only am left, a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose. See, they get to choose first. They get to flip the coin, see what side of the coin they get. Let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire on it. And I'll prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire on it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I'll call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he's good. He's God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Now this was the mother of all duels. Okay, this is the Super Bowl of faith. Because this was not a duel of the prophets. This is a duel of the gods. This is a matchup of the gods, because it was Baal, the Canaan god of fertility, the Canaan god of fertile crops and rainstorms and thunder and lightning in a land that hadn't rained in a while, and the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And so here's, the, here's what the prophets of Baal do, verse 26. And they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it, and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two sayas of seed. Now that's about seven gallons total. And he put wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. See, Elijah here, he wasn't going to let unfaithful power brokers and unresponsive people stop him. Because he was an unstoppable priest. See, God doesn't depend on the power, the power brokers. He doesn't depend on people and popularity. God just moves, but he uses priests to show people the movement of God. And Elijah was an unstoppable priest. So I want to say to you, be the unstoppable priest. Be the unstoppable priest. In times when there's spiritual crisis, be the unstoppable priest. Don't be discouraged by government. Don't be discouraged by people. Be the bridge. Be the conduit that declares the power of God. See, Elijah knew what the odds were. People today are making odds on who's going to win the Super Bowl. Okay? Well, there were probably odds makers back there on Mount Carmel. They said, oh, this is going to be an easy one. The prophets of Baal are going to win because, look, there's 450 prophets of them, and there's only one Elijah. Well, Elijah knew the odds were different. The odds weren't 450 to 1. The odds were 1 to nothing. Okay? Because this wasn't, this wasn't a duel of the prophets. This is the duel of the God. One true living God and nothing. Okay, so, so, so Elijah knew that, so he was the unstoppable priest. Well, church, we're the priests for today. We're the priests for today. We are the Elijahs for this age. And Peter said it this way. He said, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood. We're the priests. 
that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness in his marvelous light. That's what we're doing. We're calling people out of darkness. And, and that's what Elijah did in verse 30 of our text. It says, Elijah said to the people, come near to me. What was he doing? He was calling them out of darkness. He said, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. You see, as a role of the priest, what we're supposed to do, we're to be that bridge, that conduit of God. And we need to bring people near so we can show them what God is doing all around them. And we never say to a lost person, we're done with you. We never say to someone who disagrees with us, we're just done with you. We don't do that. We say, come near to me. Let me show you something that will change your life. That's our mission, helping people embrace the life-changing truth of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 30, it says, He repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. There was a ruined altar there. Well, I want you to know lives around us have all been thrown down. Many of you are living in thrown down lives, altars that have been broken, marriages that have been shattered, addictions that you're struggling through, broken families, uh, homelessness, all kinds of things, lives in ruins. And, and those throw down lives, they could be beautiful sacrifices to the Lord if someone would only come and help repair them. In church, we're the priests of this age, and we repair altars. We repair altars that are broken. We're the royal priesthood. We have a divine obligation to intervene in the lives of people who, who feel like their lives are ruined and, and their lives aren't useful to God anymore. We have a divine obligation. If you don't believe me, read James chapter 5. Tell me I'm wrong. I dare you. This was Elijah's work. He said, people come near to me. And then he repaired the altar. And then he, he built it up in the name of the Lord. See, everything is done in the name of the Lord. As a priest, everything is done in the name of the Lord. We don't represent ourselves, we represent God. I want you to know, as a spiritual leader, my job is not to get you to follow, follow me. My job is not to get you to, to share my vision. My job is to get you to follow the Lord. My job is to get you to sense the leading of the Holy Spirit and see God move in power. It's not about my pet projects or the next building or anything like that. It's about the leading of the Holy Spirit. So look in verse 36 of the prayer that Elijah prays. It's a prayer we could pray today. O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I'm your servant. And that I've done all these things at your word. Answer me, O oh Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you've turned their hearts back. It wasn't about Elijah. It wasn't about his vindication. It wasn't about him getting that showcase ministry on top of Mount Carmel that people are going to talk about for centuries and centuries and centuries. It's not about that. It's helping people to know that the Lord is God. He still moves in power and he's turning hearts back to himself. In the midst of unfaithful leaders, in the midst of unresponsive people. And God moved when no one expected God to move except for one unstoppable priest. And in verse 38 it says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones. That's a fire. And the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. And said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The most important movement of God in power was not the fire that came down out of heaven. God does that with almost every thunderstorm. The great movement of power is that people that were apathetic and unresponsive and not hearing God, they fell down on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. That's the mountaintop experience we need today. That people that just give a nod to God would fall down on their faces and say, Lord, you're God. Lord, you're God. People, people in the name of God, accomplishing the will of God, in the power of God. That's what we need. What does it take? 
Well, God's power is moving no matter what. What it takes is for us to be unstoppable priests. What it takes is for us to be that bridge and see God moving and show other people that God is moving. Are you ready to be the priests for a world that needs to hear it? Are you ready? Are you ready? Before you can be a priest, you actually got to be a follower. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, if you've been that unresponsive person, I pray that this is the day you're going to see him move in power. You're going to give your life to him. And you're going to draw near to him. And if you've already done that, I pray that this is the day that you have a, a, a new found just determination to declare the marvelous, the marvelous light when he called you out of darkness. I pray that's what he's going to do in your life. We need to be the priest. We need to all stand together. I want you to stand right now. We stand together. We need to say together what they said. The Lord, He is God. Say it with me. The Lord, He is God. Say it again. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. One more time. The Lord, He is God. Be the priest, church. Be the priest. Lord Jesus. Hi, my name is Walter West. I'm pastor of Anastasia Baptist Church, and I wanted to thank you for joining us for this Real Life, Real Hope message. In today's message, we talked about, about mountains of faith. One of the mountaintop experiences that we have is that we see God moving in an incredible, incredible way. And, and just like Elijah, who was a bridge between God and people, Jesus Christ is a bridge between God and people. And if you have never experienced that life-changing experience with Jesus Christ where He forgives your sins, He does the miracle uh, of your salvation, the miracle of opening up eternal life, life forever with Jesus in heaven, I encourage you to make that commitment today to trust Jesus, uh, to follow Him as Savior and Lord. Uh, if you need some help in this, I just want to encourage you to contact us. We'd love to talk to you. Uh, you can find Anastasia Baptist Church online at www.anastasiachurch.org. Or you can call us. Our area code is 904, and then the number is 471-2166. Or you can come by and see us. Anastasia Baptist Church is found locally in the St. Augustine, Florida area. We're a spiritual lighthouse helping people embrace the life-changing truth of Jesus Christ. I pray that you experience that life change. And until next time, God bless you.